country's going through a major crisis and it's up to us as socialists and trade unionists to put forward arguments to transform our economy and to offer solutions to a global crisis that put people, health and the planet first. Now, as a publication, Tribune has its roots in the struggles of the 1930s, where in a crisis of similar magnitude, socialist figures like Nye Bevan and Stafford Cripps recognised the need to make strong, unapologetic and socialist arguments that were sadly all too lacking from the official leadership of the Labour movement. And in this difficult period, we at Tribune are very glad to be able to work with the RISE, which has already hosted several excellent conferences uh, in discussing where we go forward today. Arise is an incredible celebration of our values of solidarity, socialism and unity, and we're delighted to be a part of it. Uh, now, due to a huge level of interest, as well as in the Zoom seminar, uh, we're streaming live direct from the Arise YouTube page and from across various Facebook pages. As the event goes on, please post questions in the comments below the stream on here and in the Q&A section on Zoom, and we will put it to our panel. So joining us today, uh, firstly, is Andrew Murray who is the Chief of Staff for Unite the Union and who released his new book, The Fall and Rise of the British Left, on Verso last year. We've also got Amy Fletcher, who is a secondary school teacher in Tower Hamlets and a National Education Union rep. We also have Faisal Yusuf, who is a junior doctor and a very active member of the BMA and Unite. And Richard Bergen, who is the Labour MP for Leeds East and the Secretary of the Socialist Campaign Group of MPs. So, Andrew, take it away. Thanks, uh, Marcus, and thanks to Arise for the uh, invite to join you uh, today. Now, we're looking at class politics coming out of uh, uh, COVID, and it's not difficult to make the case that the coronavirus uh, crisis has indeed been a class crisis, if you look at um, the rampant inequality in society that has been exposed by this crisis across one uh, area after another, from uh, uh, housing, education, low pay, who's had to carry on going to work throughout this crisis, which working people are dying uh, as a result of it. It's care workers and bus drivers, um, it's not hedge fund uh, owners and so on. Uh, and all of this uh, a crisis that we can see is shot through uh, with the consequences of racism and racial inequality uh, as well. But I think that if our response is to rise to the level of class politics, it has to do more than just register these you know, very evident facts, which are, uh, are now clear to liberals and even some conservatives uh, as well. I think a class politics response has to focus on two things. One, it has to be a systemic uh, critique of where we are and how we got here. And secondly, it has to offer uh, an alternative. Now, all the issues I've identified, and I'm sure there's many others and uh, other speakers will no doubt elaborate on them, they can all be addressed by palliative measures and those all have the uh, value up to a point. Those are where we uh, start from and those are perhaps what people can to some extent be most easily mobilized around uh, immediately. But if those measures simply leave the system that got us here untouched, then it's a very truncated form of class uh, politics. I think we have to be clear that uh, this is a crisis that is rooted in, in capitalism and in the particular forms it has taken in Britain. I mean, one question we all need to be asking is why has Britain been so much worse in handling this? Why has it been so abject. I must admit that, you know, going into this crisis, I didn't expect the government to play a blinder, but you wouldn't have thought that uh, uh, our country would by some indices be just about the worst uh, in handling uh, the pandemic uh, anywhere uh, in the world. And it also looks like being the case that the economic crisis, the economic consequences are going to be worse uh, in Britain uh, too, with the, the fall in GDP being um, world beating, uh, uh, really. Now, I think this speaks to uh, the depletion uh, of uh, the state, the chronically high inequality uh, in Britain and the uh, unbalancing of the economy uh, towards services and financial services that has gone on uh, over uh, a long period. To some extent, the fact that we, we've gone into this in such a weakened way is a consequence 
of the austerity of the last 10 years, but it's also a consequence of the underlying nature of the system that the Tory imposed austerity has been designed to protect. Uh, it's not just uh, the cuts, uh, which have been obviously so damaging in a large number of areas, but also the fact that this has been an attempt to prop up a system uh, at the expense of working people, and the Tories have been fairly successful uh, at that. Uh, and it, it's the underlying nature of that system that they're trying to protect by uh, austerity that has to be put in the framework. I mean, one obvious thing to say now is that this isn't a, a, a short-term crisis. This is one crisis coming on top of another. If it's the case that well, it was told now Britain might recover from coronavirus by 2023 economically, that means that we're in 2023, we'll actually be at the same level of living standards for ordinary people as we were in 2008 when the bankers crisis hit. We're now talking about a 15 year period uh, where our society has been mired in uh, stagnation. And this is an issue in the end uh, of uh, class power uh, and how and for whom uh, power is used to uh, defend and promote uh, in this country. So I think we need to look at what we can do to challenge that. I mean, not just to engage in rhetoric. Uh, I mean, firstly, and most basically, I think we need to really try and build up the trade union movement. I think, you know, masses of working people have understood the value of trade unions, sometimes for the first time, as a result of this uh, crisis. And as a basic line of defence and an organisation that can raise demands, put pressure on employers and government, uh, building trade unions is absolutely essential. Secondly, we need to look at the power and the impact that has been made over the last year, first by Extinction Rebellion and more recently by Black Lives uh, Matter. These are movements that are really forcing the pace uh, on both on particular issues, but on raising the nature of power. I mean, Black Lives Matter seems to me absolutely fundamentally a class organization. And some of the initiatives it's taken, uh, and in particular, the, uh, and, uh, and say initiatives it's taken under this very broad umbrella, which has proved an effective way of mobilizing, pulling down that statue in Bristol, that highlights how racism has been built into capitalism from the beginning. It's not a sort of marginal thing or a, uh, or, or a sort of uh, a bolt on. Uh, racism in different forms from slavery onwards has been absolutely built into the working of this system. So the movements that are challenging that, uh, I think, need to be uh, uh, built on. Thirdly, uh, and this is particularly but not exclusively for people who are in the Labour Party or are active and affiliated unions, we need to try and defend the positive policy legacy uh, of the period of Jeremy Corbyn's uh, leadership. Uh, Keir Starmer has said he's going to stick with that, so let's hope that that proves to be the case. But there is still a strong left in the Labour Party. There's a stronger socialist campaign group of MPs, which Richard is part of. Uh, and, you know, we need to be making sure that the Labour Party catches this moment and continues to argue, as Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell did, for a systemic alternative uh, to, uh, um, uh, to the system that we've got. Uh, and finally, in terms of things we can do, I think building things like the People's Assembly, the um, uh, anti-austerity movements, that is still going to be profoundly relevant. Uh, you know, Boris Johnson is saying there's going to be no going back to austerity. In fact, he was saying that even before the pandemic. But the pressure within the Tory party will be there and the interest that it serves will demand you know, some form of austerity when they try and get out of the debt that's been accumulated. And George Osborne was saying that to a House of Commons committee this week. He was saying, you can't solve this by taxing the rich or, or business. It has to be either cuts in public spending or an increase in the general rate of income tax, which clearly impacts on, uh, on working people. So mobilising against austerity is vital uh, as well. I think it's out of these sort of struggles and demands that we can develop the put some meat on this build back better uh, idea, which is not a bad slogan, it's alliterative, which is a good start. And uh, uh, it, it does capture the idea we can't go back to the way uh, we were. But I think we as a, as a socialist have to fundamentally uh, raise the question uh, of class power uh, in this, 
uh, of uh, really saying that the whole system of power needs to be changed and getting rid of economic and social inequality without getting rid of it first the imbalances in power uh, is not going to uh, really work. And our, our objective, the ultimate objective of class politics is working class political power. And that's the prerequisite for socialism. And one of the huge achievements of the left in the last five years has been socialism is now back on the agenda uh, as a systemic alternative. And that is our lesson that we have to draw from the pandemic, uh, as well as everything else. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, we're now going to Amy Fletcher from the NEU. Uh, so uh, when you're ready, Amy. Thanks very much for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm going to kind of outline really what's been happening in schools for the past few months um, and what this means kind of for the future. And I think I would agree with Andrew in that we are facing a kind of triple crisis at the moment. So we've got the COVID pandemic, we've got economic recession, and then we've also got the biggest uprising against racism since 1968. So I think when we talk about what trade unionists are facing today, it has to kind of go beyond just thinking about the COVID crisis. Um, in terms of kind of thinking about where in Tower Hamlets we started before this, so we won um, a historic strike ballot um, over changes to our terms and conditions and we were going to go out on strike with Unison for three days and unfortunately that had to um, we had to cancel that because of Covid um, and obviously that was a big blow because of the kind of um, you know the, the struggle that we'd won there uh, and unfortunately the council are now trying to push that um, those changes to terms and conditions through but just for central council staff so even before all of this started you know there was kind of struggle going on within the union um, and to kind of think about where we were um, before schools shut and um, I think it's quite important um, as well to say that the right-wing press have been kind of moaning incessantly this whole time saying you know schools are shut um, you know, teachers are kind of dossing around at home. Um, actually, we've been in school, we've been uh, on the front line working with key worker children and with our most vulnerable children. And we've been doing that uh, without PPE, with very little guidance, uh, many reps with very little health and safety experience. Um, and so before we even get to kind of the biggest struggle that we face in this period about wider reopening, uh, we, we face kind of potentially life-threatening situations as workers. Um, and you just have to look really at the number of deaths uh, amongst health and social care and transport workers who've been forced to work throughout this crisis and the fight um, that you know unions like the RMT have put up um, to see what could have happened really in schools. And actually, Niall Ferguson did come out and say that if lockdown had happened a week earlier, deaths would have been halved. Um, and I think it's important to say as well that when many workplaces first closed or people shifted to working from home, um, Rishi Sunak rolled out what many people were calling progressive policies. So, you know, the furlough scheme, for example, and it soon became very obvious that these measures were there to protect bosses. They were there for profit. It wasn't about workers because we've seen many workers have lost their jobs during this crisis with no support from the government. So, you know, you've got 9,000 Rolls Royce workers who are uh, whose jobs are being axed and that's about a fifth of the workforce there. So, this is kind of the context of what we were up against uh, when the Tories were desperately trying to get people back into work and therefore desperately trying to open schools again. Um, and they moved very quickly. You know, as Andrew said, we have the highest death rate many people um, are reporting in the uh, kind of out all of the European countries, yet we were, you know, very quickly being forced back to work. Um, and there was absolutely no consideration for local context in this either. So, for example, in Tower Hamlets, it's got a massive Bangladeshi community um, who are much more likely to die from coronavirus. Uh, there's been zero kind of, um, you know, the context wasn't being looked into. And it's no coincidence that obviously primary schools were the first target because, um, you know, it's about the economy. It's always been about the economy. This kind of narrative about disadvantaged children education um, is just comical really to teachers and support staff because we have been working obviously through a decade of austerity and um, we know that the Tories don't care about disadvantaged children. Um, so there has been a big fight uh, by trade unionists to oppose the government's reckless plans for wider, re wider reopening and there have been some quite significant wins. So um, because of the work of reps, most primaries didn't open on the 1st of June. Um, vulnerable workers, including black staff, have been supported to stay working at home. And I know that most school trade union groups have written to their head teachers in support of those staff and fought for those staff not to come in. 
Um, the government had reversed plans to fully open primary schools before the summer and free school meal provision has been extended to over the summer, obviously in a big part because of Marcus Rashford's campaign. So I think it's really important that we succeeded here by fighting the government. And the reason that the NEU has expanded over this period is because we've been seen to be winning. Um, and I have to say that NEU reps have put up way more opposition to the government than the Labour Party leadership has in this time. And actually, Starm has been calling for a return to workplaces throughout the crisis. So I want us to resist any agenda which suggests that the government are not going to attack working people as this crisis recedes. You know, we're being told now that we face the biggest recession in decades. And we know that that means that Sunak and the Tories are going to attack working people again, as we saw in 2008. Um, and just kind of bring it back to what we've been doing really in our workplace groups. Um, there is no doubt in my mind that our, my union group especially, has uh, strengthened during this period. And that's kind of to do with what the National Union has been doing uh, across the country, but also because of the anger that people feel, you know, amongst the rank and file. So that's really brought workers together. My union group is much stronger. We're making these vital demands, um, which our school leaders are having to listen to. Um, and people really want to fight where many members have felt in the past that we cannot win. Um, and I think that, that crisis, the crises that we're facing have really brought people together. And it's worth noting that last week, Public Health England, uh, in their report, it says that acute respiratory outbreaks in schools have risen by 70% last week. So we're currently trying to, in my school, put a stop to plans to instruct all staff in. So, you know, that's hundreds of people for a training day on Friday. So that's our latest battle. Um, what I think has been incredible about this time for school trade unionists is not just how the COVID crisis has galvanised people over safety at work, but also it's opened up these wider political discussions. So we're talking about cuts to uh, local services for young people and how difficult that's making our job now in this crisis. We're talking about cramped housing conditions in Tower Hamlets. We're talking about how the BLM protests are kind of leading to action over decolonising our curriculum um, and being anti-racist educators. And we're making the links between that racist police brutality and violence um, and the higher risk that black and brown people, particularly working class people, face in terms of COVID deaths. So um, last week, for example, there was a national uh, NEU BLM solidarity webinar and thousands of people joined it. So there has been a tangible shift within the union because of the increase in struggle that we've seen during this crisis. So just to end, um, I think it's truly a moment for us to argue for and fight for a progressive and radical education system um, that puts people's interests in our communities at the centre of what we do. And there should be no going back after this to the exam factory, Michael Gove model of education. Um, and we must centre our union activities, not only on that vital workplace struggle around health and safety, but also on a complete overhaul of the curriculum. And, you know, the same goes for other workplaces. This has to be a, an opportunity to us for, to, to fight for uh, total overhaul of what we experience at work. Um, so these are uncertain times and it's a time of crisis, but it's also a time of revolt. Um, and after our heavy election defeat, we have to get organized in communities and workplaces. I don't think we can rely on Keir Starmer and I want to uh, ask everybody to join the union and the fight's just started, but I think it has to be won through struggle. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, really well said. Um, and on to Faisal Yusuf next. Go ahead, Faisal, whenever you're ready. Thanks, Marcus. So good afternoon, everyone. My name's Faisal. I'm a junior doctor and trade union representative working in the NHS. I worked in intensive care as a foundation doctor throughout the COVID peak and have since moved on to now working across general medicine specialties. I organise within the BMA and I'm a member of Doctors in Unite and today speaking in a personal capacity. So if the COVID crisis has shown us anything in healthcare, it's that in all healthcare systems, be they socialized such as ours in the NHS, or applied to market forces such as those in other capitalist society, that there are prevalent health inequities and inequalities. The history of infectious disease is the history of loss of life amongst those with the lowest income and the least to gain from capitalist social relations. I'll start with a quote um, by Marx and Engels from the manifesto. The executive of the modern state is but a committee for managing the common affairs of the whole bourgeoisie. The function of the state in capitalist society, as Marx and Engels stated in the 19th century, is not in the interest of those that create the wealth, but rather those that own it. Health and social protections and policies, be very in wider society or on the wards that I work, 
ultimately have the aim of protecting those that hold wealth. Ralph Merliband, in his 1969 work, The State and Capitalist Society, reaches this conclusion through analyzing a number of varying state structures and concluding that the notion that businessmen are not directly involved in government and administration is obviously false. They are involved ever more closely as the state becomes more closely concerned with economic life. Wherever the state intervenes, there also an exceptionally strong position as compared with other economic groups will businessmen be found to influence and even determine the nature of that intervention. Now, healthcare theorists have worked on this question of health inequity for decades. In 91, Dahlgren and Whitehead created the model of the social determinants of health. This seminal piece of work outlined the building blocks for someone's health. Previously to this um, work, many within my profession viewed those with poor health as, as in the most part being ill because of individual lifestyle factors, such as eating badly, smoking, drinking, or other choices made to be unhealthy. This model stipulates that socioeconomic, cultural, and workplace conditions have a direct effect on health. Um, whether they be marketized healthcare systems, poor trade union representation, poor housing, or even availability of community organizations. The determination of whether people will live a life blighted by illness or morbidity is not secondary only to their individual choices, but rather to the choices of the state that governs them. When this model is applied to what I've previously described, it's no surprise what's happened, um, what, that what has happened in COVID has happened. So to begin, the chance of catching COVID has been worst amongst those working in workplaces with the lowest ability to social distance and where the virus is able to spread freely. Healthcare workers, a number of whom are relatively low paid, are disproportionately exposed to COVID compared to workers in higher paid workplaces, such as tech startups or financial services. Those who work on our railways, such as the Lake Belly Majinga, are also increasingly at risk of contracting the virus. Shop workers, teachers, and a number of people from the working class are all at a high risk of catching the virus, and in the most part have not been protected because of the nature of the state and capitalist society. What about those who've been most ill and required admission to ICU? So this is based on data from the ICU National Research Council. While the poorest two income quintiles in society made up over half of those admitted to intensive care, with the top richest two groups representing only about 30% of admissions, in terms of racial inequalities, about 10% of patients admitted into ICU were black, compared to nearly only 5% of the population being analyzed being of black origin. And this was similar in Asian people where 15% were in ICU were of Asian origin, compared to about 10% of the population being of Asian origin. If you were poorer, you were more likely to require organ support, such as mechanical ventilation or renal replacement therapy, like dialysis, with the most deprived being about double as likely in requiring at least some sort of organ support and intensive care. From the day you stepped into intensive care, you had a 60, 40 chance of leaving alive or dying in ICU with COVID-19. This chance of death increased by requirement of organ support. In terms of the national picture of deaths from COVID, including intensive care units and other settings such as the community, there's been a clear class aspect to mortality. So this is all based on data from the ONR. So some of the worst local authorities in England and Wales by deaths per 100,000 include places like County Durham, Middlesbrough, Preston, Blackburn, Blenheim, Gwent, Holton, Hackney and Brent. Just think about the features of these communities. There was, a two, there was a two times higher death rate in urban areas compared to rural areas. When economic groups were ranked into deciles, according to indices of multiple deprivation, the death rate amongst the poorest, amongst the poorest was half of that of the richest, with the bottom three poorest groups representing 43% of all deaths from COVID-19. And of course, we all know the disparity when it comes to ethnic minority groups. We know that after adjustment, the likelihood of a man with COVID-19 of black ethnic background dying was two times greater for males and 1.4 times greater for females compared with those of a white ethnic background. So why is this all the fault of the state in capitalist society? So this is the fault of the state because of the political choice it has made to represent the interests of business over the lives of people. It's decided that the working class do not deserve safe and not overcrowded housing is decided that the working class must not be able to social distance, is decided that the working class must rely on support from the state to survive, leading to a four times increase in applications for universal credit in one week in March, 
is decided that the working class have to go back to work despite a pandemic with early on five times as many construction workers brought back to work than those in professional scientific and technical activities. And it is decided that after centuries of forced deprivation, that the genetics of the working class will have changed so much that even when they catch a virus that should affect people equally, that they should be at such a higher risk of dying. So what must we do when this is all over? Well, my view is clear and it's rooted in socialism. We need firstly strong trade unions with bargaining rights in every workplace. Uh, for example, one big healthcare union with branches representing sites rather than professions. We need worker-run company boards. We need worker ownership. We need safe and clean and not overcrowded housing. And ultimately what we need is the abolition of an economic system that is killing us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Faisal. That's really fantastic. And to move on to our final speaker, uh, we have Richard Bergen. Uh, I would say, though, uh, be sure to get your questions in because there's obviously going to be plenty to discuss. So if you want to just uh, fire off your questions in the Q&A there, don't forget. All right, Richard, on to you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Marcus. And it's been really useful to hear uh, the other uh, speakers and the perspectives uh, that they bring. And the coronavirus crisis has to be approached from a class perspective because the government is certainly approaching it from a class perspective. I think Amy's remarks uh, reflected that reality because the desperate rush to prematurely reopen schools before it was safe to do so was actually about unlocking the profit machine. The government recognised that key to unlocking their profit machine was getting the schools fully reopened or more widely reopened so that the state in effect could look after people's uh, children and then the government could increase and intensify the push to get people back to workplaces even when they're not safe and even when they're non-essential workplaces and that was why the National Education Union uh, and the teachers were so demonised by the right-wing press because that was the front line of basically a form of class conflict, a form of class conflict between those at the top who want the priority at this moment in time and at every moment in time to be the pursuit of profit and those who think that people and people's safety in our communities uh, should be put first. And of course, we've been uh, facing the coronavirus crisis not only after 10 years of conservative austerity, which is class politics on behalf of the ruling class, making the majority pay the price uh, for the uh, errors of the bankers and the capitalist class. Uh, we also come to this coronavirus crisis after the domination for 40 years of uh, neoliberalism in this country. And that is what has led to us being so ill-prepared. It's no coincidence that it's three of the worst performing states in the world and neoliberal economies, the UK, Brazil and the USA when it comes to the coronavirus crisis. This is no coincidence whatsoever. And the coronavirus crisis has illuminated the reality of 40 years of neoliberal domination. Yet again, you see uh, in the care sector, you see in terms of the class divides and the racism uh, in our society. Something else that was said earlier that, that I think needs to be emphasised is the fact that people shouldn't presume that state intervention uh, is always good. People shouldn't presume that state intervention is always socialist. I think people are making a big mistake to think that because the Conservatives have used and the government has used the power of the state in the coronavirus crisis, that means that's somehow a victory for socialist politics, a victory for socialist economics or a victory for socialist uh, ideas. It's a myth that neoliberalism doesn't uh, have any role for the state. Neoliberalism was once uh, defined as the desire to turn the whole world into private property. But of course, uh, a state is needed uh, in order to maintain that system in the interests of the privileged minority against the interests of the majority. So whilst the neoliberal ideologues want the state to retreat from areas in which its presence will help working class people and support working class people and protect working class living standards, they of course need a powerful state at the centre in order to make that happen and in order uh, to uh, control that situation as well. So it seems to me that our job as socialists, as our, our job as people who believe 
uh, in class politics from the perspective of the 99% of the working class in all its diversity need to be pushing for the state to be mobilised uh, in the interests of the 99%. State intervention itself isn't automatically uh, socialist. It would be a mistake uh, to uh, think uh, that uh, it is. And of course, at this time of crisis, there'll be plenty of people in powerful positions who try to use this crisis uh, as an opportunity to further their uh, agenda. And we see a good example of that, or rather a bad example of that, in relation to British Airways and United doing a great job campaigning against that, because what BA are doing is using the crisis as an excuse, using the coronavirus situation uh, as cover to sack tens of thousands of workers and rehire many of them on uh, far uh, inferior terms and far uh, inferior uh, conditions. And if they can get away with it, that would be the blueprint for everybody uh, in our country, uh, in the working class. What we need to do is to campaign uh, and support uh, those struggling against uh, the um, the class politics being waged uh, by those at the top. And as has been mentioned, the Black Lives Matter movement is a crucial part of that. What we need to do is to support those minorities in our country who are at the tough end of the fight against racism, who are at the front line of the fight against racism. And we need to campaign to win a movement of unity amongst the working class in all its diversity against uh, racism and for a more equal and for uh, a more uh, just society. And it's correct that we can't wait for parliamentarians to deliver that, especially when the Conservatives have an 80-seat majority. The U-turn that was forced the other week on free school meals, of course, uh, is credit to uh, Marcus uh, Rashford. Of course, his credit to Rebecca Long-Bailey for pushing to get an opposition day debate the other Wednesday, which meant that there was going to be a vote on this in Parliament with rebellions from some Conservative MPs if the Tories didn't do a U-turn. But fundamentally, it was a victory for people power. And we're going to need a whole lot more people power in the weeks, months and years ahead. We can't wait for the next uh, general election to fight back. We need to fight back now. The National Education Union and other unions have shown the way forward in terms of fighting back. The Black Lives Matter movement has shown uh, the way forward in terms uh, of fighting back uh, as well. Now, of course, Parliament is an arena of the class struggle, but it's only one arena. And socialists wouldn't be doing their job if they vacate other arenas. The class struggle takes place, of course, in Parliament to an extent, but it takes place fundamentally on the streets, on the picket lines, in the occupations uh, and on the marches and the campaigns. And what we as parliamentarians on the left are trying to do is serve those movements outside Parliament by using our elected positions to amplify the demands uh, on uh, those uh, um, uh, Amplifying the, amplifying the demands uh, of the movement. And so there are huge tasks ahead. Experts and economists are saying that what's coming along the way, unfortunately, is something that will make uh, the banking crisis of 2008 uh, seem like uh, a walk in the park. What we're moving towards, unfortunately, is an economic situation not seen since the 1930s. So for people who thought that 1945 to 1979, for example, was capitalism behaving in its normal way, settling down. I think many of us are now recognising and many people are now recognising that actually that relatively, and I only say relatively, benign period for the working class uh, in our country, only relatively uh, benign in comparison with what came after with Thatcher, uh, was actually the exception to the rule, not the rule itself. And now what we are seeing is the true nature of free market capitalism and the true nature of the neoliberalism uh, which has been pushed uh, since 1979 in this country. One minute there, sorry, Richard. Yeah, so we can't have a return to business as usual, but we shouldn't presume that if we don't intervene as a left, that what's going to happen is a return to the unfair business as usual. If the left doesn't intervene effectively, then what will come after this public health crisis will not be a return to the unfair, disgraceful business as usual. 
what will happen is we'll be opening up something even worse than business as usual. And that's something as socialists we cannot allow to happen. Thank you very much, Richard. Really, really well said. Uh, so we now go to our first round of questions. Uh, we just have two up here. Uh, so the first for the panellists is, what are the key demands that the left should be advancing now as the lockdown eases and as the scale of the economic crisis becomes more apparent? And the second is, what are the three top priority questions to maximise short term impact, build long term alliances and shift class forces? So I think we'll start the way we did it just then, uh, Andrew, if you'd like to begin with those. Uh, well, in terms of the demands, there are obviously a huge range. Um, from the point of view of Unite, we have focused on three things which clearly have general application. The first is safety. So there shouldn't be a rush out of lockdown simply to suit business interests. Uh, anything should reopen uh, as and when it is safe, including safe for the workers uh, for it uh, to do so. The second thing is the protection of employment, uh, that there is clearly gathering on the horizon a tsunami of redundancies. We're already seeing it starting in some places like uh, British Airways and parts of manufacturing. This could be devastating for millions of people and many communities. So there has to be a demand that the government simply don't just walk away, uh, say, well, we've had the, the job um, uh, scheme, the 80% uh, furlough scheme, we're winding that down uh, and we're, that, that's our role over. No, it isn't. We have to be fighting for uh, a maintenance of employment. And the third is uh, maintaining wages and living standards, uh, which, uh, again, are going to be under huge uh, pressure as a result, you know, with, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the crisis being used to uh, screw down uh, wages. So I think I don't pretend those are comprehensive. I mean, there will be specific demands for uh, in relation to education, the health service, of course. Uh, but I think those those are three places to start from. Uh, now, as in terms of what the key movements are to build our uh, power, if that was the second part of the uh, of the question. Well, I, th I do think just to repeat what I and others have said, 100% trade unionism has to be a start. That is a foundation of working class uh, strength. Uh, and, um, you know, trade unions, people are now seeing their value. So we should build uh, build on that. I mean, like Amy was saying in Tower Hamlets, uh, that, that that's, that's uh, I think, a far more general picture. Uh, and then secondly, uh, Black Lives Matter, it raise, raising the most profound questions uh, about the nature of our society, about the nature of capitalism and about the nature of imperialism and building this you know, global anti-racist insurgency has to be absolutely uh, a priority. Uh, and the third thing is the, I've called it anti-austerity campaigning, but it's, it's the left has to agitate in the working class communities, including the sort of working class communities that uh, voted Tory in the majority in the last general election. Uh, because I think to a certain extent, you know, the left has got out of the way of agitating in a number of communities, of raising demands, building organisation there. Uh, but we can't, um, you know, we can't vacate that space or, as we're seeing, right wing populism can uh, fill it. Thank you very much. Uh, and on to you, Amy. Yeah, I think um, in terms of key demands, you know, and protecting jobs, I would be pushing for the green revolution really as as one of the key demands for uh, creating jobs after this crisis. Um, and I think I'd agree really with what Andrew said, but I'd also, I think this crisis has put a real emphasis really on housing um, as being something that we have to make key demands around. And I think, you know, all of the points that are being made around um, deaths amongst working class communities, a lot of that is to do with, you know, the fact that people are living in cramped housing um, and you know and again the issues that have come up around you know people's people losing their jobs uh, you know how, I think it, is it just three months or the, two years sorry that is pushing for people to pay back their um, rent and I think that's probably a key demand that we need to be making is around housing um, affordable housing and social housing. Okay Faisal? 
Yeah, so for me, much like the other speakers, so the key demands for me really um, recognizing that, you know, the wider social policy has such a direct impact on health is safe housing, um, probably refunding of community organizations. So things like youth centers and cultural groups and closing of the economic gap that is one of the worst in the world between rich and poor in this country. In terms of growing power, I think for me, it's really remembering what made us feel so strong in 2017 after that general election. Um, give up this, for the Labour Party specifically, for me, it's giving up this idea of respectability politics and being good managers of capitalist society and staying different and radical the way that we all felt in 2016 for the first time. Okay. Thank you. And uh, we have an, another round of questions now. Uh, so this is a question uh, from Tusif Shah. Uh, how do we get to a unified left leadership in the UK? Oh, sorry, I, sorry, I completely forgot. Uh, I'm so sorry, Richard, I got caught up there. No, don't sorry. worry. Sorry, don't worry. Mate. No worries at all. Well, I agree with what the uh, other speakers were saying. In terms of three um, key campaigns, obviously putting public safety and protecting lives first, protecting living standards, and that relates, of course, to wages, jobs, uh, housing. So also protecting living standards, but also trying to advance living standards. Also, I think making demands on the conditionality of state intervention. Uh, the government will uh, intervene uh, to bail out big corporations without a doubt. So as a movement, we should be campaigning uh, for this only to be supported uh, if certain conditions are met, conditions of trade union recognition, conditions of everyone being paid a real living wage, conditions of these corporations taking their environmental responsibilities uh, seriously, conditions of not using uh, tax havens. In terms of important campaigns to support, of course, the campaigns of fighting trade unions uh, need to be supported, absolutely. Black Lives Matter uh, needs to be supported and all the anti-austerity campaigns as well. I think we also need to understand that the class politics from the ruling elite won't necessarily take the form of austerity. Uh, it may take the form of austerity, uh, but it might not be overall cuts in public spending across the board, given the scale of bailouts. It might be cuts to certain parts of the public services uh, and uh, strategic support for other parts of the public services. But what we'll definitely have is an attack on uh, working class living standards that might take the form of regressive taxes such as VAT, deregulation of workers' conditions and wages, and obviously using potential mass unemployment to further drive down wages and push for further uh, flexibility in the interests of their bosses, or a combination of all of these things. So I think those uh, are the key things that we need to be mindful of in our activism uh, going forward. Thank you very much. And uh, sorry to drop you in again, Richard, but these questions are becoming very uh, Labour Party centric. So if you don't mind, I'm going to go straight back with you and go in reverse uh, with these. So the next two questions are one uh, from Facebook. Uh, some argue that for Labour to win an election, we need to mitigate our criticisms of Boris's handling of the COVID-19 crisis and distance ourselves from Black Lives Matter. What instead is the electoral coalition the left should be trying to put together? And the second question, how do we get to a unified left leadership in the UK, i.e. whether partisan politics is still the right way to go about it or whether an umbrella movement is the only way forward? OK, well, there are two interesting issues that have been raised. If anybody thinks it's morally right or electorally advantageous uh, even uh, to distance ourselves from Black Lives Matter or stop um, criticising Boris Johnson, then they are fundamentally wrong. Boris Johnson has presided over a disaster. It's because of Boris Johnson and the Conservative, Conservatives that thousands and thousands and thousands of working class people in our country have lost their lives unnecessarily. So the idea that we wouldn't be criticising them, if you can't criticise a government whose approach has caused the death of tens of thousands of working class people, then when can you criticise them? Experts are saying that if they'd have introduced the lockdown when they should have done, the number of deaths would be about half of the current uh, rate. The Times newspaper uh, said 
that in the 22 day period from when the government should or could have brought in lockdown and when they actually did, the estimated number of infections from coronavirus in the country went from 1,500 to about 1.5 million. They delayed, I believe, because they were toying with the idea of herd immunity. They de delayed, I believe, because of Boris Johnson's libertarian politics, this idea that the state shouldn't really interfere in inverted commas with the profit machine or with people's uh, lives. Uh, and so they do need to take responsibility uh, for that. So we need fundamentally to support Black Lives Matter. We need fundamentally to hold the government to account for its mishandling of the coronavirus uh, crisis. Um, it's the right thing to do and we need uh, to do it. In terms of the question of unified uh, left leadership, well, I believe really that the leadership of the movement in a way uh, comes from uh, below. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn's leadership of the Labour Party was so refreshing because it was about empowering mass movement. It's about giving a voice uh, to mass uh, movements. Political parties and the Labour Party uh, is uh, necessary. I do think the idea of ditching political parties would be a kind of liberal uh, delusion. But what we do need to do is be non-sectarian. The Labour Party is not the be-all and end-all. Campaigns involving people, for example, are part of no political party are important. We can't be just focused on what the Labour Party does in Parliament. But then, of course, the Labour Party doesn't just exist in Parliament. The Labour Party needs to be a mass movement in our communities. We need to work with the trade unions, work with anti-racist campaigns, work with environmental campaigns, and that's how we become a living, breathing political party operating uh, not just with socialist theory, but with socialist practice as well. Okay, Faisal? Yeah, I agree with everything that Richard said. I think I'll start with the question about um, umbrella organisations and partisan politics. I think the Labour Party is already one of the biggest umbrella organisations in the world, um, you know, coming with a, as a coalition of the trade unions and the social movements. I think, obviously, um, what Richard said about organizing with groups that aren't necessarily political parties is really, really key. So remembering the importance that the anti-austerity marches in 2015 had in the election of Jeremy Corbyn and the moving of the Labour Party to the left. And I think really that those are our roots. In terms of criticism of the government not being successful for the left in the next election, I, I, th I think the question I may be looking at it the wrong way. I think the government are actually on the back foot currently in terms of the public. I think they're under a lot of criticism, especially about their lateness to action and especially on Dom Dominic Cummings. And I think it would be foolish of, a, of, of us not to seize this opportunity. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, on to Amy. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think it's interesting what, what Richard just said about, you know, the, the leadership, United Left leadership coming from below. Um, you know, when I think about what is politicising people in my school and in, in my borough, it is being involved in struggle. You know, you I think it you have to start there. And that's what has to be, I think, the focus. You know, we'll get that unity by building a strong trade union movement. Um, so I would really agree um, with what Richard said there. Um, and I think particularly because we have to, you know, we have to understand that for many people, the Labour Party isn't isn't well doesn't seem especially relevant, um, you know. And working in our workplaces, I think we have to, you know. My union isn't affiliated to the Labour Party, and there's a a reason for that, and that you know it comes back to conference every year, and there's always a debate about it. Um, and it is because I think we do have to be conscious, as people have said, of working across campaigns, working across different community organisations and that actually in our workplaces, um, not everybody is necessarily going to be a Labour Party member. So, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. And on to Andrew. Uh, yeah, not, not to repeat what other um, uh, people have said in answer to this, but I think in terms of what sort of coalition do we need to build? I think we really need to try and build on the coalition that was assembled in the 2017 general election. There's now a tendency to sort of write that election out of history as if it had never happened. But um, under Jeremy Corbyn's leadership, Labour did then assemble a coalition that both drew on its traditional areas of strength, 
and added huge numbers of first-time voters, young people and other people that had never voted uh, before. And obviously it wasn't quite enough. We needed to build on that, but it came very close. It deprived the Tories of their majority. And you can see how important it is to, to stay um, uh, open to all those forces. I mean, to cut ourselves off from uh, the Black Lives Matter movement to sell, or, or to sort of disparage what it's doing in any way or to have a sort of liberal view that, well, the demands are OK, but I don't like all this street activity. That is an absolute dead end. Uh, we absolutely need to, um, you know, build on the strength and energy uh, of those, um, you know, of those movements. Uh, and I think they, they're an essential part of the coalition uh, that, that, that Labour or the movement needs to create a new political majority. And I agree with Amy, it's not, it's not, it is a, a unity and struggle has to be the foundation of these things. But I don't think that needs necessarily be posed against the Labour Party. I mean, obviously what the NEU does it is entirely its own business. Unite's been affiliated to the Labour Party since the Labour Party was founded or Unite's predecessor unions uh, were. And I think realistically in, in the electoral field, um, the Labour Party is the is the choice we've got, which is why why I was keen to say in my opening remarks that as well as supporting Black Lives Matter, Extinction Rebellion, as well as building struggles in communities and as well as strengthening trade unionism, the fight to keep the Labour Party on the radical policy agenda it's beginning to formulate uh, is a vital part of, of maintaining a, a, a united left uh, approach. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, now, before I ask speakers to come back to summarise, uh, I'd like to thank all of you, all 400 of you, in fact, uh, for participating in what I thought was a really fantastic and fruitful discussion. We have some really important battles ahead, and I think all of us here know just how serious our fight is. To, world, to win the world we wish to see, a world where workers don't have to risk their lives for the whims of the market, a world where everyone has access to free and high-quality healthcare, and e even just a world that is habitable for future generations, it's so clear that we build for this and it's obvious how essential events like this are. And we must keep working together to insist that we have absolutely no return to business as usual when it comes to our economy and our politics. And to not only argue that a better world is possible, but also to win it. And to do that, naturally, I'd encourage you to consider subscribing to Tribune, which has no corporate backers and relies purely on the support that it makes from readers in the labour movement. From the leaked report to documents about how workers are organising during this pandemic, there are all too few voices as unambiguously for socialism as Tribune magazine. And I really would urge you to help strengthen that voice in our media landscape. Uh, I've also been told to remind you that the next Arise event, the cause of Ireland is the cause of Labour, lessons of the Irish election, is at 7pm this Monday, June the 22nd. And the speakers include John McDonnell, Mairead Farrell TD, and uh, the editor of Tribune, Ronan Burtonshaw. Uh, so... That's my spiel done, and I would invite you all to return and make some summarising remarks. Uh, would you like to go ahead, Richard? OK, thanks very much. It was great to hear from Faisal, Andrew uh, and Amy. And I think it's been a really uh, useful uh, discussion. Class politics never went away. Even when the Labour Party renounced class politics, class politics was being waged by the elite at the top, and they were better at it uh, than we were as a movement. That started to change under Jeremy's uh, leadership, and we need to ensure now that we don't vacate the field. I know people are dispirited because we lost that general election, and it's heartbreaking, but those on the left with our politics in other countries, for no reason other than having those socialist politics, end up in prison, end up being tortured, even end up being killed. So if they can put up with that, then we can dust ourselves down after that defeat and intervene in the way that the left needs to intervene. Coming down the road is a huge attack on working class living standards. And we'll only be able to be part of that fight back. If we recognise what the working class is in all its diversity and understand uh, the economic reality of working class life and stand shoulder to shoulder with all of those who are fighting back against the inequities and injustices of the neoliberal capitalist system, whether that be the Black Lives Matter movement, a fighting trade union movement, or Extinction Rebellion. We all of us need to fight back. And I'll finish on this. For those who think that left socialist politics have somehow gone out of date 
on the 12th of December 2019, they're wrong. Actually, the scale of the economic crisis on its way means there'll be even more demand, even more need for those big radical interventions of public ownership and the state being used and mobilised to protect the interests of the majority than there have been for many, many years. So my message to everyone is keep on going. Let's have a working cl uh, class unity, the unity of the working class in all its diversity against racism and for a better society. Well said, Richard. Thank you very much. Uh, on to Faisal. Thanks, Marcus. So for me, it's remembering that in our society, health inequality will always be prevalent under the nature of capitalism as it is. The Marmot Review 10 years ago showed the sheer inequality in, in life expectancy. He said that when he got on the tube from Westminster for every stop that he went, he, the average population's life expectancy would drop by a year for every single stop. Coronavirus has shown these inequities and inequalities clearly, but they were already there in their nature. For us to have better healthcare, for us to live longer and to be healthier, we have to implement socialist policies because it's the only thing that will save us. Thanks. Thank you. And Amy? Yeah, it's really interesting because I think, you know, exactly what Faisal's just said applies to education. I think it's, you know, we are, this, this COVID crisis has given us this space in all of our workplaces, whether it's in schools or hospitals or wherever to, um, you know, talk about what capitalism does um, and you know I think that struggle has to be about making those kind of radical changes in all of our workplaces going forward um, and so that that's kind of really what I want to end on you know in education we want to be um, challenging systemic racism in schools we want to be challenging the kind of exam factory model um, of education I think that has to be be done through trade unions and we can't can't rely on you know the Tories to hand that to us and we've got many years before the next election so we've got a fight on our hands. Thank you very much Amy and finally Andrew. Thanks Marcus well I mean there's a rather cynical political saying which is don't let a good crisis go to waste uh, and that, of course, is what the Tories under Cameron and Osborne did in 2010 uh, when they used the bankers' crash for an all-out assault on uh, welfare services and state provision uh, under the banner of austerity. I don't think we should let this crisis, the present crisis, go to waste, uh, though. It is providing, as with all the arguments, and we've heard them, or many of them, uh, this afternoon, uh, for a more uh, fair, equal and just uh, society, um, it, has, it has put some, uh, some wind in our sails after the defeat of December 2019 uh, that the, the socialist argument is more relevant than ever. So I'd just like to end with suggesting that everyone listening here can do at least three things. One is if you're not in a union, join it. And if you are, recruit in your workplace. The second is support any events locally or in your workplace around the Black Lives Matter not just as an act of solidarity with the victims of racism, but because it is raising the most profound questions about the nature of capitalist and imperialist society. And the third is read, study, uh, read socialist theory. And uh, I mean, struggle is essential, but struggle without a sense of where one's going and where one's trying to get to uh, is, is blind. So take the time to uh, read, study Marx. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, so again, thank you very much for all panellists who are fantastic. Thank you to Arise Festival and thank you to you, the viewer. Um, have a lovely Saturday afternoon. It's uh, quite nice where I am in Lancashire and I uh, hope to all see you soon. <laughs>